Welcome to The Bigger Picture, a podcast series where scientists from King's College London School of Biomedical Engineering and Imaging Sciences and people with experience of cancer try to understand the bigger picture behind cancer diagnosis and treatment. What's it like to be a patient having a scan? What's it like being a scientist developing a new diagnostic test or cancer treatment? Together, we look at cancer diagnosis and treatment through the eyes of both scientists and patients in order to get clear on cancer and to look at some of the exciting research in this area. I'm your host, Maggie Cooper. Let me introduce myself. I'm a pharmacist and I've been working with radioactive drugs for more than 25 years now. However, my interest in cancer started much earlier than that. When I was nine years old, my father died of cancer. I'm one of four children, and so my mum ended up having to look after all four of us on our own. She had to find a job when previously she'd been a mum at home, and things were quite challenging for us as a family. But it made me really determined to look into cancer treatment, and so that's how I've ended up working with radioactive drugs. It's a bit of an unusual field to be working in, but it's really exciting and there's lots of developments. In this podcast, I'm going to interview a series of patients and also some scientists from our lab. I'm hoping that the interaction between the patients and the scientists can help us forge new areas for research, maybe to think about things in a different way that we already do. Because being a scientist in the lab, sometimes we don't really get the bigger picture of what it's like being a patient, having cancer diagnosis and treatment. We hope that your experiences will help shape our research. In this episode, we're going to focus on breast cancer, and I'm going to talk to Rachel about her experience of being diagnosed with breast cancer. And then I'm going to speak to one of our scientists, Dr. Julia Blower. She's developing a new radioactive drug that can be used to look where the cancer has spread to the rest of the body. So first, let's hear from Rachel. I just wonder whether we can start maybe um, if you'd like to um, tell us a, a little bit about yourself. Okay, well, my name's Rachel. I am 44 years old. <laughs> so I'm to try and forget these days. Um, I've got, I'm married to Jonathan. I've got two children, Esther, who is 12, who started high school in September, and Nathaniel, who's nine and a half, so he's in year five. Very, very lively kids. Um, Esther, Esther's into everything. Um, football, playing the piano, learning languages. And Nathaniel does nothing but Lego and Minecraft, really. <laughs> and more. Yeah, mine, mine like Minecraft too. Um, well, we're, we're on this podcast, we're, we're here really to talk about um, cancer and you have some experience of that. I just wondered whether you could um, go through the, if you can sort of take yourself back to when you first found out that you had um, cancer. Right. Okay. I think it was 2016. That sounds right. Yeah. Anyway, it must have been about the May or June and I decided to go to the doctors because I found a bit of a lump in my right breast and the doctor looked very doubtful and said she didn't think it was much and she called another doctor in and they both said oh no that doesn't feel like anything but we'll have to send you for a biopsy anyway so I had a biopsy which is one of the worst things that have ever happened probably the worst biopsy was probably the worst bit of it actually and then and then um I went back for the results confident that nothing was wrong and I went it was asked to go in and speak to the consultant and I opened the door to him and he said oh dear are you on your own oh that's not a good start yes no so we then we then started a ridiculous farce where I, he said can you get your husband here so I said yes I think I can I think he's in his office in Chester so I rang him and he left work straight away and I waited and waited and eventually I phoned him and said, what are you doing? Where are you? And he said, he said, he said well, he was re- reading me all these signs you could see. And I said, where are you? He said, in the main corridor at Arrow Park. I said, no, I'm in Clatterbridge. <laughs> <laughs> so that wasn't a very good start. So we kept the doctor waiting for ages. And then, to be honest, I don't remember, I don't, there's an awful lot I don't remember. 
one thing I do remember is I can't watch Homes Under the Hammer anymore because they always had it on. They always had it on the TV in the waiting room. <laughs> but I've always, I always thought it was quite interesting till then. But now it just makes me think of the waiting room in Clatterbridge. So I can't watch that anymore. And pretty much straight away, they they said um, it's not showing. They'd done the biopsy. They said it's showing as sort of low to medium grade cells that are not invasive. So they said, we do recommend that you have the surgery, but relatively soon, but there's no rush. So as, as we were coming up towards the summer, I said, well, you know, they said we've got to have the lymph node, you've got to have this done and that done and the lymph node biopsy. And then we do the surgery and we'll, you know, we talked about a reconstruction and all that sort of thing. And I said, if it's not urgent, can we make sure I can still take my, we can still take the children on holiday? Because he originally said, right, like the end of July. And that's going to be an awfully long time for the children to put up with being at home, having not had a holiday and not really understanding what's wrong with mum, because they were only seven and four at the time, I think. And Nathaniel was just due to start school. So I, um, he said, no, there's no rush at all you go and have your holiday because the holiday was set for right at the beginning of the holidays. So it wasn't going to make, wasn't going to make much difference. So we arranged the holiday, <laughs> went off camping in the Lake District for a fortnight. And halfway through that holiday, I ended up in hospital with something else. Oh, no. I've never been in hospital in my life. <laughs> so I ended up having another other surgery, which, which um, resulted in the mastectomy being put off a fortnight. So um, you say that the um, the biopsy was kind of the worst bit, and that, that's interesting from my point of view, obviously, because we have got techniques which we're now using for diagnosis, and um, mm. we want to try and use non-invasive um, techniques for diagnosis. So, what was what did you find so sort of traumatic about the biopsy? I just remember it kind of felt like being shot. <laughs> oh. It, it was just horrible. I can remember crying when I came out, crying when the after, like after it, and nothing, even like nothing else, struck me as that terrible for some reason. I don't really know why. I don't really know why, because it can't have been as painful as other things that happened since. But that's what really struck in my mind. Stuck in my mind. You'll just feel a sharp needle. She'll just, she said, you'll just feel a prick from it, like a needle or something, a bit like an injection. And it didn't feel anything like an injection to me. I think the other problem with the biopsy is sometimes if you pick out the cells, you're not picking out necessarily um, a good mixture of the cells that are present in in that. Um, yes, so well, that pick out cells that, that are that's fine. An interesting well, point because that that is part of my story. Oh, tell me. Is that at the at the after I'd had the surgery and they did a is it a histology report is yeah. that what you call it where they analysed everything they'd removed they said no there were high grade cells so that would have while they had to they still hadn't detected any invasive cells but they said that once it had, once it had gone from high to medium it's something I can't I can't remember exactly they said something like it actually doubled the chance of it becoming invasive within five years or something like that they said so because all, all a lot like right from the beginning he said you know we said we can't he said, he said you know I, I can't promise you you will become become ill from this little lump he said it might never ever change but my recommendation is that we remove it and it turned out he was definitely right yeah, <laughs> sounds like we made, the right, we made the right decision. It's highly, it's quite, it's quite likely I would have been, you know, would have made me ill eventually. So, yeah. One of the things that you had there was um, a sentinel lymph node biopsy, and normally yeah. with that they inject a small amount of radioactive um, material. It's a small um, particle essentially, and mm. that um, then flows from the breast area into the lymphatic system. And lymph lymphatic system is the way that cancer, that, that particular type of cancer, can spread into the rest of your body. Mm -hmm. So they're looking to see if there's any cancer in those um, the, what they call the first lymph node or the sentinel lymph node to see whether um, it, you know that, that, that that's um, it, whether it's spread and the way that they can work, they, it's difficult to know which one is the sentinel lymph node. So uh, these small particles, they get trapped in the first uh, lymph node. So um, mm -hmm. can you, maybe can you talk us through, do you remember that that particular procedure, you know, did you have a scan? Uh, did they just put it in and then you went into surgery? How, how did it all work? Do you remember? 
I I think I went to I think I had an I think I had the injection I think it was the day before. Yeah, okay, that's reasonable. I just had an injection and then I went for the surgery. I don't yeah, remember I don't remember having a scan. No, some, sometimes they scan um and sometimes right. they they don't it's not um crucial that no. they scan it's more of a kind of almost like a confirmatory thing and, and seeing you mm. know where because sometimes it's difficult like if you have um for example um melanoma you can also spread in the same way and yeah. it can be quite difficult to work out where the sentinel lymph node is whereas with breast cancer it tends to be um in the axilla anyway you know underneath the arm essentially so um yeah. it's a little bit easier to, to work it out and then once you're in the surgery you wouldn't remember this but they would have had a radioactive probe and they would have um, been like using the probe to work out which one was the sentinel lymph node and then they would have taken yeah. that out so yeah, did, they, did, they did it exactly. take out did they, do you know how much they took out when they did, did that because this is, this is one of the issues that one of the things that we're working on is to try and um minimize the amount that needs to be taken out or even prevent anything having uh, to be taken I, out. I don't know i've got i've got a scar that's probably slightly about about an inch long so I don't remember being told how much they were taking out, actually. I don't remember thinking it was particularly awful, except that you have got this risk of, um, I can't know what it's called, that swelling up. Yeah, yes. <laughs> After having it done, I can't remember what you call it now. It is, it's a risk, and in the past it used to be much more of a risk. Before they had that sentinel lymph node um, test that um, that you had, mm -hmm. it was much more complicated. Uh, that they, they'd take out all the uh, lymph nodes, and, and obviously then the risk of that of having that sort of swelling it was was much greater. So that's a, mm -hmm. a quite a big progress in the last um, well last, <laughs> since I've been in the field, but I've been in the field quite a long time now. So um, it's, yeah. It's good, but one of the things that we're working on in our department is is um, a, like a tracer that will um, give an MRI image and a nuclear mm -hmm. medicine image at the same time, and we hope that we would be able to tell whether um, the that central lymph node has got cancer in it or or not right. um, before without having to do the surgery. Yeah. I've not I've not had any problems, but I've heard of people that have you know end up you know you could get infection in that in that in that arm or something. You can end up with all sorts of horrible swelling and. And I've heard, I've heard of people happening to people. So it's quite a, it's quite a worry. It, it feels like a tiny operation at the time, but actually it can, it, it, it can cause problems afterwards, can't it? So Very much I think that'd be amazing if you can manage to do that. Yes. Um, so you, um, did you have two separate surgeries? Did you have one surgery for, for that lymph node biopsy and another surgery for the um, actual mastectomy? Yes. Yeah, the lymph node biopsy was might have even been a month before. I can't remember. I can't really remember now. It was it was a while beforehand. Yeah. And then I had I had sort of I had some reconstruction done while I was having on the at the same time as the surgery, which made it quite complicated. And then I had two and two more small operations afterwards. Yeah, I mean, they haven't given you any um, any other treatment though, or, or, or have they? Have they put you on no. any medication? No, no, just just. I was on some. I've, I've been on some oxyphen. Yes. Yeah. I've, I've finished. I've just finished taking that. Well, and then, and then presumably they'll they'll do some sort of check on you every so often. Will they give you a? I have I have a mammogram. I have a mammogram every year. Yeah. Until um, they said I have to have that for. I can't remember. It was either five, it, was, it must have been ten years. They said I would have an annual mammogram, and by that point, I'd be in the I'd be in the standard system for having one every so often anyway. Yes, I mean you're, you're relatively young um, still. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's what everybody kept saying to me. And then I found out somebody my cousin knows who was two years younger than me. Became, got the got something very got a very similar cancer a few months after me. Yeah. What were your mm. um what were your main sort of worries or concerns um you know through this whole thing because I mean I can't I can't imagine what it's like um being on on your end of things. I don't know. I think if I was in your position I think I would be sort of concerned for my children, you know, well, what happens if this spreads? Mm. What happens if um you know it's it's really terrible and you know it all goes pear-shaped. I mean were, were those concerns that were facing you at that time or um I, I, how did you feel? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, strangely, I find I find it easier to talk to you as someone I've never met than I did to tell my own family what was happening. Yeah. And yeah, it was it was a concern because it was a very it was it was, you know, they were so young, they sort of didn't really know. Mummy's gonna have an operation and that means they that means they cut bits out of you. And that's about all this that's about all they seem to understand. And they just thought it sounded horrible. And why why are you letting them do that to you? One of them said to me. And and Nathaniel was, you know, I was I wasn't I was stuck at home, not hardly able to move when Nathaniel had his first day at full-time school. My mum had my um my husband, my husband's work were very good, but my mum ended up um, coming and staying over for a couple of weeks to take so she said so that she could take him to school every day so it wasn't different people all the time um yeah yeah I mean I, th- I think that, it, that, was, that was really that was hard I never actually felt like I was ill yeah as such because I, I I feel you know I, I feel really really fortunate yeah, so you were but, lucky that's well, you, you weren't were, were and weren't lucky. You were lucky because you um you got it, it was diagnosed relatively early, and that was yeah. due to you um being proactive and actually saying, Hey, this lump isn't normally here, and going to your doctor. And I think that's probably a really important point is to say, you know, if you do yeah, have definitely. any concerns, go to the doctor. And even your doctors didn't think there was anything serious, but they still took the right course of action yeah. and sent you for the biopsy. Now, if they if you had yeah. waited you know, maybe you'd waited another year, then that the, the, those high grade cells may, may have become invasive and that, that would have been another story altogether. So this yeah. very early approach. So you say you're lucky, but actually um, it, it was you. <laughs> you're responsible for the fact that you're, you're um, have fit and healthy. Yeah, enough, really. yeah as I say, it, I was, you yeah, know, it was obviously, it was major surgery, which involved, involved some quite strong antibiotics afterwards because it comes with, you know, it's a high risk, it's high risk of infection, isn't it as well? Mm. From that point of view but it was it was surgery and rest there was nothing you know i wasn't i wasn't ill as such when i was at the royal marsden there um i mean that was an excellent hospital and they did things just really really well but you would occasionally see um these people who had very very swollen arms um, and they were breast cancer patients who had had a uh, lymphadectomy uh, where they basically had the whole of their lymph nodes removed because um, they had got cancer in, in them. And, and that still needs to be done. You know, there's, there's not much you can do if, if it's spread to the lymph nodes, then that's the treatment that you normally do is to remove all the lymph nodes. But in um, patients who you don't know whether it's spread or not, then you wouldn't want to do that. I think in the past they did do it um, anyway, almost like it was a preventative thing. Um, but then it's, it's not actually that long ago because it's within my memory uh, is when they started to do the sentinel lymph node studies. And in, in that you had a, like a small radioactive injection put it in. And then um, you'd use this probe in the in the theatre to see uh, where the radioactivity had spread to because it would get trapped in the first node that it, it reached in the same way as the cancer cells would go to that first node and sort of get stuck there or certainly reside there for some time anyway so you could then find out which was the sentinel lymph node and then you could remove remove that and you could then analyze that and see had it got cancer in it and if it had if that node hadn't got cancer in it or sometimes it's more than one of them but you know those nodes hadn't got cancer in them then you could be pretty sure the cancer hadn't spread and no further surgery was required but if it had spread then you could remove the rest of the lymph nodes but even that some of those patients who have that sort of more minor um, surgery they still can encounter problems um, with this the lymphedema and um, so if you if we can do something to prevent them having to have that surgery then we could really help patients in, in some way so that takes us on to the, the work that we're doing um, in our labs uh, in the um, Biomedical Engineering and Imaging Sciences at King's College London and the work that you're doing, um, Julia. So maybe first of all, you could introduce yourself, um, tell us maybe a little bit about you, um, you know, what, what's your background and how come you ended up working with radioactivity? So my background, I'm a trained chemist. Um, my lectures um, when I was doing my chemistry degree, um, I was always very interested in the sort of biological application of chemistry. 
And so when I finished my um, my chemistry degree, I looked into you know, what I could do with that and um, came across um, this sort of area of, of nuclear imaging and um, using my chemistry skills um, to attach um, radioactivity to these bi biological molecules um, to then use them in, in patients later on. So you've had to um, sort of gem up on the biology side of things um, in order to do this role. You, you come with a strong chemistry background, but the understanding the biology of, of say, cancer or um, understanding you know, how body, uh, these molecules uh, uh, are treated in, in the body or how they, how they move around in the body is, is kind of a new area um, from, from what you did as an undergraduate. Yeah, absolutely. So um, this this area particularly is is very um, multidisciplinary. So it involves chemists, biologists, physicists, mathematicians, clinicians, all all sorts of scientists come together to solve problems um, surrounding disease. Um, and chemistry is just a small part. And I wouldn't call myself a chemist anymore. I know bits about all of these things now. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the strengths of um, the department is that we have people with um, lots of different uh, coming from lots of different backgrounds. And, um, you know, you, you can learn stuff of uh, other people and uh, that really benefits the research that we're doing within the department. Let's have a look at the, um, the this particular um, study that uh, one of the studies that you're you're working on, which is, is related to um, sentinel lymph node imaging. Um, I just want to can, can you maybe explain a little bit about that project to us? Yes, so as you were explaining earlier, um, one of the, the disadvantages of, um, of doing these lymph node biopsies is that some patients can um, have uh, long term side effects, as, as you described. And what we're trying to do is um, find a method of detecting which lymph nodes are diseased. Um, but non-invasively, so without having to remove them. Um, if they are diseased, then of course we will then remove them. But if we can leave them in place, if they're healthy, then this will help patients prevent uh, side effects um, later down the line. So what we have is um, a, uh, a type of particle. Um, so these are um, spios. So this is super paramagnetic iron oxide nanoparticles. And um, these can be detected by a um, imaging um, a modality called MRI. And when you inject these uh, particles into the body, they have a particular feature, which means they are taken up by macrophages. Um, so these are white blood cells which are circulating in your body, but they're particularly high concentrations of, of white blood cells located in your, in your lymph nodes. So your lymph nodes are part of the system that sort of helps um, remove uh, waste products from the body. So the white blood cells take up these, um, these um, iron oxide particles. And so um, you get this very high concentration um, in, the, in lymph nodes of, of healthy lymph nodes. And these show up on an MRI scan. And this will tell us that the uh, lymph node is healthy. Now, when we have a cancerous lymph node, so if you imagine yourself inside a lymph node and you look around, all you'll be able to see is cancer cells. There will be a much lower concentration of white blood cells around because there's just there's just no room for them. So um, you'll get a much lower accumulation of these iron oxide particles. And when you take an MRI scan, this will show a different signal. Um, and so we can use this technique to tell whether um, a lymph node is diseased or not. So whether it's healthy and if it's healthy, we can leave it where it is and if it's cancerous, we can go and take it out. Um, and that's the essence of our research. So that's quite, that's quite cool. So the, um, the, the lymph nodes that have got the, uh, that haven't got any cancer in, they'll show up a nice little bright image on their MRI scan. And if there's some cancer in, you might get maybe like, a, like half, you might be able to see half of it. It depends how much cancer there is in there. If it's full of cancer cells, there's no room for the macrophages. And in fact, I think the macrophages can sometimes take up the, cancer cells so um yeah they, they're not then able to take up the, the nanoparticles anyway so you, you just kind of get a, a dull signal or no signal at all that that's pretty that's pretty cool so now this imaging is going to require both uh oh, no wait let's let's see you didn't mention radioactivity ah no, where does radioactivity come in <laughs> so um 
this so the MRI technique is very good if you want to sort of zoom in on a particular area. So, so the MRI technique specifically, if we look at a very specific area, so we, we know where the lymph nodes are, we can look at them and then say whether a lymph node is healthy or not. That's great. But what we actually want to do for a patient who's had cancer, we want to look at the whole body. And a much better technique for that is using PET. So this is positron emission tomography. And this is using radioactivity um, sort of attached to a molecule. So in this case, we've attached radioactivity to our iron oxide nanoparticles. And um, when we inject that particle into the body, we get this nice signal and we can follow exactly where these nanoparticles are going. And on the whole body level, we can see where these nanoparticles go. So once we've then seen where these nanoparticles go or don't go, we can then zoom in on that area and then look at the health, um, the sort of health status of the, of, the, of the lymph node. Yeah, I mean, that's very important in certain types of cancer. So for example, in um, breast cancer, the, uh, l- the, the lymphatic system basically drains into the axilla, which is the bit under your armpit, essentially. And so that's not so difficult to find the sentinel lymph node in those cases, but maybe a patient's got me- melanoma then that's much more difficult to locate where this sentinel lymph node is. And that's where our technique may really um, be very important. So would the patient then have to have a scan using a camera that can do both PET and MRI, or is it two separate uh, scans? So we have the technology to combine these two. Um, um, A very creative name, the PET MRI scanner, (laughs) both at once. but you can also do it, do it separately. Obviously the, the advantage of having it combined is that you have one scan, the patient only has to you know, undergo that, that one procedure. And you know, we, we have that technology now and hopefully they, these, will become, these will be appearing more and more in the clinic and can um, you know, help diagnose more and more people. Yes, I think sometimes people think that it's, well, I, I think maybe people in the research side of things, not the patient side of things, uh, often think it's competition between uh, different scanning uh, methods you know is MRI better than PET you often see in the science literature uh, something like that so uh, this imaging was better than, than that imaging but in fact uh, when you combine these two different techniques together it's very very powerful and it gives you a much better diagnosis than um, either technique alone so there's a, it's, it's a really really exciting um, development and it's something that has really been pioneered within our own department by Professor Paul Marsden um, trying to you know making their basically essentially making their own MRI PET scanner I remember going down to the PET center and seeing uh, it in, in parts uh, down there the different uh, bits of the the scanner that they were they were making so it's really really exciting to see that actually coming into um, clinical use now um, it's, it's a great development. So let's go, go back to our, our project with the iron oxide particle. So what um, sort of steps did you have to take in the development of this, um, these iron oxide, um, radio labeled iron oxide particles? So I think the, um, the function of the, of the iron oxide particles is quite well established in, in MRI terms. Um, but what was new is, is putting our radioactive atom onto the, onto the iron oxide. Um, so first of all, we have to develop a method to attach our, our radioactivity to the iron oxide. And then we have to check that that um, radioactivity stays on the iron oxide for the, for the whole entire procedure. So that we, we call that our sort of the stability of the compound. So we have to measure that. Um, and we also have to check um, the function of these um, of these uh, iron oxide particles. So um, do they behave as we think they do? Are they going to be taken up by macrophages? Um, what we don't want is for them to be taken up by cancer cells as well. Otherwise we'll, we'll have the same you know, image, whether, whether it's a healthy lymph node or a, or a cancerous lymph node. Um, so we'll start in, in, in cells to, to check, you know, are they taken up by white blood cells? Are they not taken up by cancer cells? Um, and when we understand all that, we can move up um, in, in, and go into sort of preclinical models. So this is sort of small animals um, and check on a sort of whole body level um, and see exactly where these particles go in the body. Do they go um, to the lymph nodes, for example? Um, and once all these things are in place, um, we can you know, test 
um, to a certain extent levels of toxicity. Once we've answered those questions and we're happy, we can then consider translating that um, into patients. Um, and then that's the, becomes someone else's job. My job is up to the preclinical stage. Yes, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting like how many little safety um, checks that we have to do. You know, it, it seems like it's something sometimes quite straightforward, but it, it really takes a lot of time and a lot of uh, dedication to get something like this um, to the stage where it can actually be used in patients, um, even in a, a clinical trial. You know, we've, we've talked about clinical trials and you know, people have talked about clinical trials for the vaccine for COVID, for example, and, you know, the, how much testing is required. But you know, the amount of testing that has to go on before you even get to that stage into the patient is, is quite interesting. And, you know, checking that things, uh, that the radioactivity doesn't fall off, as you say, or that it, it isn't, these particles aren't taken up into the wrong sort of cells. So it's a lot of um, a lot of work that's gone into uh, in any of these um, these these types of studies to get something into a patient. But it's quite exciting, isn't it? Really, I mean, can't um, yeah. It would be very good if we can um, actually do this in in, in patients and and really if, if you can save them a day in the operating theatre or a morning in the operating theatre, it will really be a, a massive thing. But in the in the original um, the clinical trials that we will need to do, we'll have to um, you know, use this technique and, 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 and see what happens. And then the patients will have to carry on with a normal course of treatment. Um, and then we'll be able to compare the results from uh, the, our, our method and from the, the sort of standard method in order to work out whether um, our method works and hopefully it will. And, you know, and, and if, that, if that's achieved, then we'll be able to uh, recommend this as a method for um, checking whether the patient's um, cancer has spread through the rest of the body. So yeah, it's good, good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to um, Dr. Julia Blower there for giving us um, insight into um, some of the developments that were, are going on in our, our labs. And also thanks very much to, to Rachel for sharing her experience. Now, I thought it was really interesting that she talked about the biopsy being um, quite difficult for her. Um, certainly, that that isn't the case for everybody. I know, know other people who have gone through the same experience and you know uh, had no trouble with that at all. But the, the main thing, though, that really struck me about the the interview that I had with Rachel was that um, really it was her being quite proactive in in picking up that there was a problem and um you know if you do have any new um lump in your breast that you know is uh, doesn't is normally there your is there anything that you're 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 worried about maybe the change of uh, the shape or the size of of the breast especially if there's some sort of discharge from uh, the nipples or swelling or lump under the armpits any any anything odd like that sometimes people get dimpling of the the skin or a rash around the nipple any any change in the appearance, particularly of, of the nipple, that, that that is a indicator that there may be a problem. Now, it might be just a cyst. It might be nothing. But uh, it's worth going to the GP and, and getting that looked into. You know, like like with Rachel, she, she thought it was it was nothing. And um, and it was good that she got that they caught it when they did. Otherwise, you know, if she had left it, it may well have uh, been a much more serious problem. So this early diagnosis is, is so, so very important. I hope that you enjoyed this episode. Um, Each month we'll be having a a new episode where we'll be talking to scientists um, from our labs about the research that they're doing and also talking to patients about their experience of um, being diagnosed or treated for cancer or some aspect of their their cancer, which I think you'll find interesting. So um, if you um, want to um, give us some feedback, if you enjoyed the episode, you want to tell us more or you want to maybe be involved or even be interviewed, then uh, you can find us on Twitter at Big Pick Pod or um, at King's Imaging is our departmental um, Twitter handle. Um, or you can uh, write to me directly at um, margaret.cooper at kcl.ac.uk. If you want to make sure that you don't miss uh, the next episode, then please subscribe on your podcast um, provider's um, platform or app, um, and then you won't you won't miss miss an episode. But um, until next time, uh, thank you for listening, and bye for now. <laughs>